All right. So Dr. Banyaga, this is the first time I've seen you, I think, since you got your PhD, probably, right? Yes, yeah, first time we've seen each other like in the face in a few years. In the face, yeah, yeah, yeah. You used you used to have longer hair than me, and now I'm I I'm the one with with the long hair. Now. You can't really see it now, but oh uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's I got I got the man bun still oh, yeah, going cool. on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just a matter of time. Um, yeah, man. But uh, do you want to talk about where you are right now and what you're doing professionally? Sure. Um, well, I guess right now I'm at the Marsh Botanical Greenhouse. That's what's behind me. Um, I was going to say, if that was your house, that's like really cool. I know. I wish it was. <laughs> I kind of spend most of my time here because my internet is super unstable at my house. Oh, bummer. So anyways, I'm here at Yale University at the Marsh Botanical Greenhouse. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm working as a postdoc, my first postdoc after finishing my PhD in uh, May at the University of Arizona. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what, what did you, what, what kind of stuff did you do your PhD on? So what I studied my PhD on, oh, my, my, one of my advisors is here, Erica, she might be, I have to stop this. Hey, Erica, Hi. how's it going? How are you? Good, good. Good. Um, I thought I would come in and just move around actually for like an hour, kind of like get stuff together. Sounds good. Is um, it all in there? Not everything is in there. There's three Tupperwares of stuff that's okay. at the OML lab. Oh, okay. You did find that. Um, but the two big boxes are here. Yeah, they're in the succulent collection. Okay. okay. I'm going to at least look to see if I can figure out what's going on with the shaper Okay. Because if there really isn't one on there, I think it's a lot less. Okay. I, I could totally be wrong. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, Jesse. Oh, no problem. Yeah, we can, I, I can snip that out and post. I can, oh, you can edit it. Okay. I can do movie magic. Yeah, Ben, I have. <laughs> okay, so uh, what are we talking magic. about? So what, what did you do your PhD on? It, does that have something to do with polyploidy maybe? Or, uh... Yeah, so what I studied for my dissertation was polyploidy and hybridization um, in a group of plants called spike moss, also mm -hmm. called resurrection plants, um, that occur naturally in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, and we were really interested in them because um, what we were finding is that there's a system where there's homoploid hybrids yeah. and then hybrids that were formed that underwent an additional round of genome duplication. So those were allotetraploids um, formed from the same parents that were coexisting in the same area um, and experiencing the same climatic conditions. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to understand what the effects of just hybridization versus just genome duplication per se were on, um, you know, species living in different speciation mm -hmm. and living, um, acquiring different tolerances, ecological tolerances. Yeah. So did, did polyploidy is, so, so the working hypothesis is that sometimes when uh, polyploid speciation happens, there's maybe the potential for like, uh, more evolvability in the in the polyploid sort of daughter species, or what's what's the thinking behind that? Why why are polyploids in, um, interesting? Or yeah, I guess yeah, sure. Yeah, I I, th I think you're on the right track there. Thinking about the evolvability, so you know when a, when a whole genome duplication occurs and that individual. Um, establishes and maybe that becomes a population um, in their genomes they instead of having just one set of genes they have two set of two sets of genes mm -hmm. um, and if that is accompanying with hybridization then you have two sets of genes that maybe had slightly divergent um, roles and you can get these kind of crazy epistatic interactions and then you know longer term you can get the masking of different copies that leads to some type of sub or neo-functionalization yeah um all of that kind of stuff tied in there very cool um and i guess just 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 quickly because it and because some of our students actually like they because we're a forestry school so some students have actually taken plant classes and stuff so so we're talking about selaginella it just in case because actually spike moss i don't even know if that's yeah do you, do you have one back there 
We actually have some, and it's really neat that they have so many. Oh, sweet. Nice ones here. They were doing some classes on plant diversity before the shutdown. Nice. And so they have some. Oh, this is, this is cool, man. Can you see these guys? Yeah. Yeah. I'd okay. I think I'd have a hard time identifying them for sure. Oh, yeah. I can actually read the labels on some of them, too. So, Lagenella. Nice. And so, so sometimes some they're... Their, these are oh, some of their tropical relatives. Oh, cool. I never yeah. made that connection with those little, those little um, guys. And then you guys probably have this one in the forest. Yeah. So, is that a, lyco, is that a lycopodium? Or? Yeah, that's a lycopodium. So, those are... These, really, really divergent relatives, but yeah. Yeah, they they look similar to me, but they're they're pretty <laughs> evolutionarily diverged, right? They're they're in the like and their allies of like the ferns and their allies field. Yeah, they, I mean, lycophytes are always grouped with ferns. Yeah, but yeah. it's but it's a really ancient split, right? Right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that was that was an awesome little uh, walk through the greenhouse. Um. Yeah. So, do you want to do you want to talk about um... so what I'm working on now? Kind of. Oh yeah. Also flows from what we were talking about. Cool. Because what I'm talking working on now is trying to understand just the effect of um, doubling the genome on cell size. Yeah. And how that scales to different anatomical structures, tissues, and then ultimately physiology and where these plants live. Very cool. With with the same system or with a different, different with a different systems? system. Now I'm working on a um, basically this um, species complex called Viburnum dentatum, which is this really widespread deciduous native shrub mm. that occurs mm -hmm. throughout the whole East. And so there's this very strong relationship between the genome size of the that's in your genome mm -hmm. and then um, the size of your cell so that when you have larger genomes, the minimum size of your cell is much larger. And so the idea is that you can have this minimum cell size can constrain um, metabolism at that right. scale. Yeah, so because it, it affects like the the sort of efficiency or the, or the rate of like water, water absorption, or it doesn't have to do with like osmoregulation sometimes or totally or, yeah. or also just like transcription rates because there's more gene copies that you could transcribe at the same time or something. Or. Yeah. I, I just deal with just like the raw physiology and um, cell size mm -hmm. and metabolism, but yeah, the whole transcripts and you know, all of that stuff definitely gets affected too. Yeah. Yeah. But it takes longer potentially to, to, for my, for mitosis to happen. Is that, is that like a measurable effect yeah. at all? Or you can't really... all cell, all cell division. So meiosis too. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, potentially like changes like the phosphorus requirements or something or the, the, like, do, yeah, not... there's some interesting yeah. things about how things with larger genome sizes, um, don't do well in certain soils. So it's kind of like a new, huh. new arena of plant biology. Like what kinds of, what kinds of soils are like polyploid? Or, or to kind of flip it on the edge, mm. um, things with really small genome sizes are often um, like carnivorous. Oh, so maybe they're the ones like also in like the nutrient limited soils. Is that, is that the mm -hmm. thinking behind that? Yeah, and then this hasn't been really, really um, tested, but I kind of have this idea, and mm. it's anecdotal, mm -hmm. that if you look across plants that have really small genome sizes, they're in these kind of, um, they're plants that are able to have some type of seasonal dormancy, hmm. like Selaginella. Ah, yeah, yeah, very dormant. Okay. Um, I'm going to get the stuff from the lab and bring it in. Did you drive here? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I put it all together. Okay. Um, where? On the bench, the that last bench, with, like all of our shot on that basically. It's where the two um, microscopes are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. No, it's, to it's totally cool. Yeah. That's, that's cool. I, yes, yeah, just like side note, it's cool that, um, 
I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess uh, Connecticut's like under different quarantine rules than we are. It's it's like really, I think it's really rare for people to be going into a lab uh, these days around. Oh yeah, cut so. that out. Um, yeah, we're, yeah. we're not supposed to be doing shit. I just, I'm kind of like the one critical researcher yeah we 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 did we did stuff like that too where, where there's like essential employees and like non-essential employees and stuff yeah so i'm like the critical researcher for like the whole greenhouse you're keeping it alive mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's cool i mean that's awesome that you have an excuse to like leave your house though <laughs> like <I'm> kind of <laughs> kind of jealous a little bit even though i'm sure that's a lot of responsibility and everything that's okay yeah um cool man well well uh yeah do you want to kind of finish up some of your uh viburnum thoughts like what what's what kind of patterns are you looking for or or what what's kind of already known and, and that you're expecting well there's been one i kind of have like two research objectives of this project mm -hmm. one of them is just to find out where these polyploids exist in the landscape yeah because we still don't have that fundamental knowledge. We know from some chromosome counts that were done in the 50s um, that there is chromosome number variation, mm -hmm. different types of ploidy levels. There's tetraploids and octoploids. Oh, wow. But where they occur throughout the Eastern US is kind of not clear. Mm -hmm. And so, there's not like a great phenotypic thing you can look for, like yeah, that's been for field identifications. Yeah, there, I mean, there are some keys and there, there's about seven currently recognized taxa. Mm -hmm. but, a lot oh, of, oh, but I mean, can you recognize the ploidy level on? Mm, I, I think you can now. Oh, okay. The work that I did this past field season. And that's associated with um, the type of pubescence hmm. and certain anatomical things about the leaves. Huh. So all of the polyploids or the higher level polyploids have this really nice stellate pubescence. Huh. And that's something interesting. I don't know why I need to look into it, but that's something you find in Arabidopsis too. Really? So when people go and man experimentally manipulate um, Arabidopsis and make them, because they're kind of diploids right now, but when people yeah. make them tetraploids and octoploids and even more, they take mm -hmm. on this stellate pubescence. Huh. So that's, so I, I know pubescence just means like there's, there's like the leaves are hairy or the stems are hairy or something or. Yeah. And what it is, is it's the, the trichomes, the tri yeah. The trichomes become branched and it's really oh, okay, gotcha. because some trichomes are single cells and some are multi cells and it depends on the plant mm -hmm. lineage and the species. So I haven't really looked into it mechanistically what's going on there, but. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting that there's like a convergent phenotype associated with yeah kind of across vascular plants yeah that's wild huh the other thing so the other things that i study are um, vein density mm -hmm. and then stomatal guard cell size and density yeah and so those those tend to be kind of correlate with like rates of carbon fixation or rates of photosynthesis or something like that is that is that the idea yeah so the idea is that things with larger genome sizes or that might be of a higher ploy mm -hmm. um, have larger guard cells, but they have less dense guard cells. Yeah. And then they have um, less dense veins, which actually gives them poorer overall maximum photosynthesis. Mm. They have lower maximum photosynthetic rates because of all of that venation and architecture of the veins um, is much more reduced. Okay, in polyploids. Right. Huh. That's so, so things with smaller genome sizes, like have a way, way higher ability of maximum photosynthetic rates. If you were to translate that into like the animal world, mm -hmm. higher metabolism. Huh. That's really interesting. I, I guess I wouldn't have known which way that would go. Hmm. But so, so in places maybe where light's more limiting is like, I, I guess I'm just trying to think about like kind of the ecological consequences of that. So were, were lights more limited than maybe the, the diploids do better or when yeah, lights not, lot not limited, it doesn't matter if you're polyploid or tetraploid because then. Hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's an interesting way to think about it because these things are really competing for light mm -hmm. um, in the field. And what's interesting about the system I'm studying is that both of these co-occur. And they're actually like touching huh. in the field. So you can get huh. you can get a tetrapoid and an octopoid that are right next to each other. Mm -hmm. And this is just stuff that I found out this, this summer. Um, but I think what they represent is different possible ecological strategies. Mm. Because you get these things, the diploids, or the lower level polypoids get yeah. uh, really fast, cheap leaves. Mm -hmm. Whereas the polypoids have these kind of really thick leaves that, that just stay on for a long time. Oh, okay. Huh. Do you, but do you think, do you think there's a difference between like the tetraploids and the octoploids or something? Like, is, is there a difference between every ploidy level or do you think it's, you kind of like max it out after a certain point? Yeah. I think if you were to go even higher, like let's go, um, the 16 ploid. Mm -hmm. Um, so usually, and some other people have done this experimentally, you don't, it's not linear. Yeah. So you it's kind of like a saturating function or, or, you know, depending on what you're looking at. It just yeah. Kinda... The only thing I've seen this in is Arabidopsis. Mm -hmm. um, but like if, when you look at different certain traits, maybe like the size of the rosette or the branching pattern of the inflorescence, yeah, you get this kind of linear relationship between diploid and tetraploid. But then beyond that, it's just kind of, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, cause it's not that uncommon, right. I, or at least, you know, there's a bunch of plants that exist in like lots of different ploidy levels in the wild, right? Like, like strawberries and dandelions and stuff. There's, there's all kinds of, you know, high level. Blackberries, you name it. Huh? Yeah. Maybe not the, it's not super common in our conifers mm, mm -hmm. in your neck of the woods. I don't know what's happening up there in New York, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I haven't I haven't done a lot of karyotyping of uh, <laughs> conifers up here myself, so yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> um, elms, though, elms oh, are, okay. are also one. I'm trying to think of other big common trees. Oaks or not? Oh, oaks are not because oaks are weird in like there's tons of hybridization, but there's I guess there's not um, yeah there's not that much ploidy variation, huh? Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, uh, with the viburnum, do you, do you think there's reproductive isolation? Like, like once they're, it's, yeah. yeah that's, I, that's something I'm testing. Oh, cool. So, um, we would expect there to be reproductive isolation because chromosomal evolution has been thought of as this big reproductive barrier, regardless of the system. Yeah. And so normally what people find is that between different ploidy levels, there's, fairly strong reproductive isolation mm -hmm. that does break down when you go to higher and higher ploidy levels. So like a hexaploid and an octoploid can have much higher levels of gene flow than a tetraploid and an octoploid. Hmm. Um, but I've been doing some experimental crosses and it's kind of too early to tell, but it looks like there might be some, um, they can cross, but oh, okay. it could be, it, it matters who is the paternal and who's the maternal parent. Huh. So, so when the higher level octop, the higher level ploidy is the, the paternal mm -hmm. pollen donor, um, that cross fails. Huh. But when the higher, but when the pollen is the lower ploidy, then, then those crosses sometimes work. Yeah. I mean, this is what's happening in viburnum. It's not necessarily something that happens throughout plants, but they're, you know, yeah. angiosperms have this um, really intricate, you know, double fertilization involving the endosperm and stuff. Right. So those different dosage balances are important during the embryo development. Mm -hmm. What about, what about with Silaginella? Is, is it, do you have to be the same ploidy level for? Um, we tried those crosses, but they all failed. So we oh. don't, we don't really know why. They're all reproductively isolated from each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in general, like ferns, yeah, there's actually a parallel occurring in ferns because ferns have lots and lots of polyploidy. Mm -hmm. um, and what people find in ferns is that the actual physical size of the archegonium, which is the thing that holds the, the embryo, yeah. um, limits the size of the sperm so that when you huh. have 
polyploid sperm, right? There is some like actual physical mechanical block going on there. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's, huh. I guess, I mean, that makes sense, but I, I, I wouldn't have, I didn't realize that there had, that the archegonium structures were so, like, like there was such like a lock and key thing almost, like that yeah. they were so closely matched. Right. That's wild. Hmm. Yeah, Very pre, cool. pre, what is that? Pre-zygotic isolation. Yeah, it's, a, it's <laughs> technically a pre-zygotic isolation barrier because uh, you can't, yeah, the, if the sperm can't reach the, the egg, then yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, awesome, man. Is, is there anything, anything else that's like burning that you want to talk about that you just want to get off your chest scientifically that you're like super stoked about? Um, oh, do you, do you want to, do you want to talk about this paper? What's man, I don't really want to talk about that paper. I hate that paper because I worked oh. on it for like five years. I'm so tired of that paper. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to, no, no, it's cool. I didn't mean to like re-trigger you. <laughs> I can go. I was. I've, I'm trying to like customize my backgrounds to to people so that there's just like a uh, you know a theme <laughs> no, or whatever. I, I, I took this picture in Arizona. It's cool. That's that's. Oh no! Cool. Don't. That's even worse. That's got fountain grass in the background. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no. Oh god. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's anything I. Um, I wish I could. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Okay, cool. That's cool. It's a video too. <laughs> yeah, it's a video. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wish I could be more eloquent with my words, but I feel like this whole um, experience that we have right now is mm. teaching us that diversity matters in all types of our human interactions, our economies. And I think that the nature has been telling us for a long time. And so it's an interesting time to reflect on why diversity and biodiversity matters. That's yeah. I wish I could be more eloquent with that. That's no, it's great, man. Um, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's a good time to, uh, to thank you for your time and uh, start signing off. All right. Well, this has been cool seeing you virtually and talking to you. Yeah, dude, it's, it's really great to catch up with you, man. I'm, I'm sorry that I, I needed sort of like an official excuse to like reach out, but um, this has been really fun to like catch back up with people. Um, what, what do you have? Is it weird? Now it's bad to ask those questions. I hated those questions. What is that? When are you going to finish? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll stop recording.